and this is completely new and you can be gutted emotionally, which doesn't help your confidence in a job market where there are 300,000 other highly qualified people looking for jobs at the same time. So it's this perfect storm of just being blindsided, embarrassed, panicked. And the worst part is that even if you survive it, even if you're the person who didn't get laid off, the company culture just sucks now. Like you you don't even wanna be there. Rich and Regular Podcast, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Kirsten. And I'm Julian. And today we're talking about four of the biggest mistakes you can make if you've been laid off. I yes. know that's not the most well, uh, well. optimistic or sort of happy new year kind of subject, but it is important, which is why we're talking about it. Um, we are going to start with some good news, though. Um, I want to give a huge shout out, really, really big shout out. I love this one. It was nice and sweet. Uh, it was from Joy Walker 314. Thank you, Joy Walker 314. They said, slowly becoming my favorite internet couple. Slowly. (laughs) I appreciate that honesty. Not yet, but like (laughs) we're getting there. Slowly becoming my favorite internet couple. Great chemistry with even better information. Incredible podcast. Rich and regular is so on brand. Love the movement. Thank you, Joy. I I love that. And I, I listen, random fact, but I literally cannot hear the words love the movement and not hear like one of my favorite albums. You don't know this album, but it's Trap Call Quest. Next time I'm going to download the song and I think I'm going <laughs> to start playing it every single time we read a review. But anyway, thank you so much, Joy Walker. And thank you for everyone that has left us a five-star review on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Okay, that is the good news. Um, let's talk about layoffs and obviously the financial implications about that. A couple of reasons why I think this is important. I had to actually stop and think because I was going to ask, have you been laid off before? No. So I've never been laid off, but I do remember working at a restaurant and I had to stop and think about this. I was like, I I, I certainly have never been fired, but I remember I came close. (laughs) I've come (laughs) close, but I remember working at a restaurant and the restaurant closed down. I'd completely forgotten about this. Yeah. And I got a message and said, hey, the restaurant's going to be closing in a couple of months. You're going to be out of a job. So I guess that is being laid off, right? Like, Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've always left before the layoffs happen. Yeah. Either the work environment gets too chaotic or I can sense it or I'm just ready for a change. Yeah. But the layoffs happen shortly after I leave. I, I just barely miss them. Yeah. So we don't have personal intimate experience, but we certainly know a lot of people who have. But I think because we've left the corporate workforce and because we have experience specifically online, but also in person in dealing with people who've been laid off, and you can kind of see what are some of the things that people are doing well. And so we're going to talk about what's working, what's not working, and that way we can help some of our listeners and our viewers figure out what they might be able to do to make sure that they end up on the winning end of this equation. But I think the biggest reason why we're talking about this is because 2023, I'm still getting used to that, 2023, we're 2024 now, but 2023 was the year of the layoff. Yeah. Like it was a horrible year. Uh, It was a 98% increase over 2022. This is at least according to one of the reports that we've seen. We've seen a couple of varying reports on this, but either way, like it was a massive year for layoffs. And according to at least this one report, over 305,000 workers were Mm -hmm. laid off in a series of mass layoffs in 2023. Uh, We know a lot of this was centered in the tech industry, but it has really impacted a little bit of everyone. Yeah. I mean, tech employees have been hit the worst, but it's definitely spread to other industries. And it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And I think the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I'm well aware that layoffs are a normal business practice. But these latest rounds just are not passing the vibe check. Like they don't feel the same. They seem like leadership wants to send this clear message to employees that whatever power yeah. and, and empowerment you thought you had in 2021, like yeah. that, that train is over. Yeah. It feels like more than a business decision and, yeah. it, and it feels like a little bit like a lashing. Like yes. this is a, a response to all of this empowerment and all of the progress that employees and yes. unions have made. And now there's a little bit of fun. Let me, let me just pull back a little bit more and really show you who's in charge. Yeah. I remember when, 
uh, in 2021, we actually did a podcast on this because quitting was at an all time high. Yeah. And it was because people recognized like the labor market was tight and employers were doing all of this stuff to retain people to prevent them from leaving. And people were job hopping or yep. taking on, you know, additional remote work just to prove a point that they had in demand skills and that these things were available. Yep. But the way that these layoffs are happening now, to your point, is not about profit or even business performance in every single case, not even individual performance. Like it's it's really just to send this message and it feels like this long threat because it's not like these companies are just doing one big deep cut. Yeah. They're doing multiple rounds, multiple slices. Some of these companies are on their third and fourth round. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this is the new normal, but it definitely ain't the old normal. And so the tone of this episode is going to match that energy. Yeah. We're going to focus on the things that you can do to protect yourself and to acknowledge that this is what's happening. Yeah. So not too long ago, we had a podcast episode where we were talking about some of the top stories that were impacting money uh, in 2024. And we spent a good bit of time talking about the Magnificent Seven and how they helped to drive the S&P 500 uh, returns in 2023 and how that might continue for 2024. We also talked about what those companies had in common in terms of them being tech companies and this huge emphasis on AI. But that's not the only thing they had in common, right? A right. lot of those companies also gained this profitability, which led to this return through making significant layoffs. And so I want to roll through a couple of them. There are several others that I think that were notable just over the last few months. And, and this is a pretty long list. So there's BlackRock, which is one of the most powerful, largest financial and investment companies. They just announced that they were laying off. 600 people, which is about 3% of their workforce. Nike, everyone's mm -hmm. favorite shoe company. Uh, they announced rolling layoffs. And rolling plant. layoffs. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> like a commitment to continue. <laughs> I've never layoffs. heard that before. They, they basically promised a $2 billion cut yes. and they're going to do it over three years. Yep. And they're not even telling you how many jobs they're going to impact, what departments. It's just like, hey, we're going to do this rolling layoff thing. Yep. So yep. prepare yourself. And I'm, I'm trying to um, sort of keep track here. We got a list that I'm referring to, but even as I think about Nike, I know that there are other companies that I know for a fact are also on that list. Nike made me think of ESPN. We're not even talking about ESPN, but they were also one. Wells Fargo, we saw mm -hmm. that article where the CEO, and, and I'm not making light of the situation, was tickled a little bit when they spoke about how they had cut a check for uh, they said somewhere between seven hundred and fifty million and a billion dollars in severance just in Q4, mm. like not mm -hmm. like not for the year, just in Q4, just to mm -hmm. give you an idea of how large that company is and uh, the amount of money that it would take to get rid of those people. Um, Spotify, we have a dear friend who works for Spotify. And I remember, you know, like a lot of other people, when they hear these layoffs, they start looking and was like, oh my gosh, I hope XYZ wasn't impacted. Hasbro, the um, toy company, Roku, the streaming device company, Flexport Logistics, Charles Schwab, City CEO, all of these companies have announced layoffs. And again, these are just like the big, large companies, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're not even talking about the smaller to mid-sized companies that don't make the news. Right. So this isn't just affecting these larger companies. It's also affecting the smaller ones. ResumeBuilder.com surveyed over 900 business leaders from companies with more than 10 employees. And 38 percent of them said that they were likely to have layoffs in 2024. And 52 percent say that their company is likely to implement a hiring freeze in 2024. Yeah. So like I'm it's just a brutal employment and labor market out there. So I feel for a lot of the people uh, that are looking for a job and obviously for a lot of the people that have been impacted. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's truly copycat behavior because some of the people in that survey presumably don't have a reason to lay people off, but they're preemptively following these large companies, assuming that they have something right. Like whatever they're doing, I should be able to replicate. And that just makes it even harder. I mean, there are several things that are hard about layoffs, but the yeah. idea of there not being this grand reason that everyone can recognize makes it even harder. Yeah. On top of that, it's highly impersonal these days. Yeah. You know, people always say business isn't personal, but layoffs, because they're happening in mass right now, are highly impersonal. You may get a calendar invite for some emergency all hands team meeting, or maybe you get called into a room with HR, and or you might just. And if you're in the room, yeah. If you're on the call, <laughs> yeah. if you're on this Zoom, we regret to inform you. Yeah. And you're wondering, like, did you get the email? Did you get the email? Did yeah. you get the email? Did yeah. you have a meeting at two o'clock? 
Yeah. And, uh, and no one yeah. knows what's going on because typically these decisions are made several layers up. So even if you have a great relationship with your manager or your manager's manager, it doesn't matter because they don't know anything either. Yeah. And it's getting worse. There was a lot of rumors when Google was doing their cuts because people would try to figure out, like, how are senior thought leaders being let go? How are new hires who were recruited being let go? And there's a rumor that the company used algorithms. And so it was kind of like a double blind test. And if you made the list, whatever criteria they put in the algorithm, then you were going to get laid off so that they wouldn't get sued for discrimination or improper behavior. Yeah. And so to recap, layoffs are unpreventable to some extent because it doesn't matter how good you are if the thing that you're good at doesn't align with the business priorities or if the algorithm says you are the one, you're gone. And then on top of that, you're unprepared. If you've had a good lucky stretch of employment where you've been somewhere for, you know, 10 to 15 years, yeah. you really don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with suddenly with no warning oh, yeah. being let go. And this is completely new and you can be gutted emotionally, which doesn't help your confidence in a job market where there are 300,000 other highly qualified people looking for jobs at the same time. Yeah. So it's this perfect storm of just being blindsided, embarrassed, panicked. And the worst part is that even if you survive it, even if you're the person who didn't get laid off, the company culture just sucks now. Like you don't, even, you don't even want to be there. Survivor's guilt starts yeah. to kick in. You don't know who's on first. It's, 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 it can be really, really tough. And so again, we empathize with everyone and anyone that is impacted by these things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the solutions, right? Or at least some of the problems that we see. And as a result, some of the things that we think people can do, because obviously there are some financial implications to this. There are broader implications. You know, finance is just one of them. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that we see a lot of people doing is that they assume that it won't happen again, right? This, I think, is where this deep sense of uh, loyalty, I might argue misplaced loyalty and trust, and just like this false sense of security that so many of us have kind of comes into play. Because when these things happen, I'm not saying you shouldn't look on the bright or focus on being optimistic or positive, but we also have to recognize that this is exactly what this is. You know, all this talk that we're family and we're friends, I think we just have to really be honest and kind of face that a lot of that is really just an illusion, right? Yeah. This is a company. They've got objectives. They are loyal to their shareholders. Yes. They are loyal to their customers, probably after their shareholders. But like we have to start, I think, getting a little bit more honest about that, because if we're not, it will make career planning and financial Absolutely. planning and all of these other things that much more difficult you'll continue to be blindsided. Yeah, and I think you just have to accept that your moral compass does not transfer to the organization that you work in. Yeah. Even if you believe that this is the right thing to do to the extent that it won't happen to you, it's not up to the people within the organization. The the point of the organization is to be loyal to shareholders. And yeah. so Regardless of whether you think this is right or wrong or wouldn't happen because we're quote unquote better than that, the same rhetoric that politicians use to get us to look past the things that we feel like are unacceptable yeah. is going on here. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, so what can you do about it? Uh, there are a couple of things that we would recommend. Uh, first, and this may sound petty or maybe a little bit immature, but you do have to kind of keep an ear to the street, right? Whether yeah. you want to call it the rumor mill or a water cooler, or maybe there's a sidebar slack conversation or something like that. You really do want to make sure that you're plugged in because while that can be a little gossipy, more often than not, it starts with someone who had access to credible information, leaked it in their own interest or in an effort to try to protect somebody or a group of people that they know, you know, and then, you know, things kind of get muddy from there once you hit the third chain or the third link in the chain. But that is unfortunately probably some of the best intel that you're going to be able to get. All right. So the second thing that you might want to pay attention to is really just quarterly performance. And sometimes this is like in, in the form of an annual report. Sometimes this might just be like an internal or a organizational dashboard. But these are the things that your executives are paying attention to. And so obviously, if you're going through repeated quarters of not hitting your targets, more often than not, that's going to trigger executives, especially CEOs, senior vice presidents, et cetera, to take 
take a look at the operation itself and say, hey, maybe something's not working. Do we have the right people? Do we have the right partners? But those obviously tend to be uh, indicators, if you, especially if the metrics that you're paying attention to relative to other teams or other departments or even another company that might be in your uh, competitive set is doing way better and not having these issues more often than not. Like those are the kinds of things that I don't want to say trigger the ego of leaders, but I do think plays a role in them making sharp decisions or quick decisions to try to stop the bleeding. And so this is one of the things you want to pay attention to. So at the end of the day, it's also a little counterintuitive. So you yeah. almost have to read between the lines because CEOs actually get rewarded for leaner business they models. Do. Whenever they're reporting business performance to the board or to their stakeholders, Holders, the less headcount that they have, the more impressive that they look. Correct. And so there is some ego in there where they might say, like, things oh, are good. We were but able to I do it been... with just 75 people. Exactly. These guys have an entire team over there. Maybe I should have some of their budget. And where does that come from? It comes from that person either being cut or that person being forced to make cuts so that we can get more of the good stuff that's going on exactly. over here. So exactly. we've been there. I don't miss those days, if I'm being honest, but um, that's something you want to pay attention to. A couple more. Uh, we spoke about this at the top of the episode, hiring and spending freezes, this like arresting of the spending, right? I've been there. It was like, stop spending, eliminate all travel unless it's absolutely necessary. All of those things are indicators that some metric is in the red and there's no clear sign that they're going to get out of that. And we better fix it because if we don't, we're going to have to start making cuts somewhere to make up for what we weren't able to do. Yeah. It can also look like more bureaucracy when you're doing hiring or spending for where sure. it's like, oh, you need approval from these six people before you can open a PO. And that's to slow it down. It's yes. not to scare people by freezing it, but it's yes. like, nah, we need to make sure that that, like the whole committee agrees that yes. <laughs> it's okay for you to spend this money. Listen, I'll keep on going. Not backfilling employees. Lord. I know a lot of us have yes. been there. It was like, well, there used to be three of us. <laughs> Oh, well, they, 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 they posted it. And I'm going to tell you right now, just because they posted it Don't does mean not they fill mean it. that they're going and to And if you've fill been it. searching for a job and you haven't heard a response, a lot of those are ghost posts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, talks of a merger. Or mm -hmm. an acquisition that I mean, that to me is one of the larger ones, right? Obviously, if we're looking at acquiring another company, we don't need two HR departments. We don't need two legal teams. We don't need two or anything, really. They start to look for opportunities to reduce headcount, to consolidate, to get rid of one system in favor of another and so on. Executive turnover is a huge one, especially, I would say, when this particular executive is like, a big idea executive or one that uh, is super charismatic and was one that led the way on implementing something and that thing isn't quite going too well, right? And and, and again, that can be one of those situations where things go from sugar to shit real quick because it was great when it was the best new thing that everyone wanted to be a part of until those quarterly re results start coming in. And right. it's like, all right, well, listen, we need to make up for it. Um, outsourcing functions or departments, I think, is another one. And then the last one I would say, this one always makes me think of, uh, what was that show? House of, House of Lies? House With, of Cards. Uh, House of, no, House of Lies. You're thinking House of Cards. Oh, yeah, House of Cards. House well, of Lies. Well, both, really. <laughs> it is both. It is highly political. House of Lies, which was a show on Showtime, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, with Don Cheadle, who yes. played Marty Khan. Yes. If you see management consultants around <laughs> your office, yeah. I'm telling you BCG, right now. BCG, McKinsey, any of them. Any, any of them. If you see management slashed. consultants, I'm yeah. telling you right now. <laughs> There's and, and I hate to say it. I po apologies to any of the, the the people who are part of the big three. We have the big dear five. friends who are consultants, we but y'all know y'all be coming in and chopping up an org. Listen, that's that's yeah. on, that's, the, that's the first thing on the deck. Yeah, cuts. Yes. Yeah, I mean, as grim as it sounds to assume that this is going to happen again, especially for people who lean towards optimism like myself, nobody knows this better than millennials who have been dubbed the unluckiest generation in terms of financial timing because so many of us were graduating during the 2008 recession. And because the stock market was so volatile, several people didn't invest and benefit from what would become the biggest bull market in history. 
And so even before the pandemic hit, we were lagging behind boomers in terms of wealth and, you know, economic milestones like home ownership. And then right before the eldest millennials, the older geriatric millennials like ourselves who are, you know, approaching our 40s, are in our early 40s, hit our prime earning years. Yeah. And the youngest millennials who are actually in their 20s and starting to begin their careers are getting, you know, that first eight years of experience, the world shuts down. Yeah. And so then you have another delay. And then three years after that, there are these massive layoffs that are happening at the same time as our predecessors, Gen Z, are entering the workforce, which just kind of crowds the market even more. And they're a competitive hire because they're presumably cheaper than someone who has, you know, 10 years of experience or 15 years of experience. It's been a tough run. It's been a tough run it's for been millennials. A tough run for millennials. <laughs> they said that the only generation that's had it worse is like the lost generation, the ones who were like went to World War One and yeah. <laughs> like it's just... but, you know, I would add to that, you know, on top of that to add the pressure in terms of job availability is that boomers and Gen Xers are staying in their positions even longer. Uh, they and have so there's to. no correct. And so there's really nowhere to go. Exactly. And so all of these things combined are really just kind of adding pressure on yeah. this generation. So Yeah. I mean, I know people who are on their third layoff now and it sucks. And, you know, this has all happened in the last two or three years and yep. they're getting used to it. But I just want to encourage everybody because there's an old saying that goes, you learn the tree by observing the fruit. And at some point you got to mm. look at this fruit and be like. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of strange. It's kind of yeah. it's not it doesn't look too appetizing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. All right. So mistake number one, assuming it won't happen again, or I would say just being unfamiliar with the signs that oftentimes lead to it, like putting yourself in a position to be completely blindsided. And as a result, you're forced to kind of react um, as opposed to having or putting yourself in a position to actually be able to prepare for it. Um, the second one that I think happens, and I think this is it's almost like a sequential relationship here, right? You've been blindsided. The second mistake that we see a lot of people do when they're dealing with the layoff is they, they kind of keep it a secret, right? They keep it to themselves. They don't want anyone to know. It's very embarrassing. They're trying to kind of deal with the shame and the struggle of it all, or just the, you know, really the embarrassment in, in many ways. And I think I understand that. Um, I've, I've come close, right? I've never been there, but I understand that that is certainly an element of this experience. But I want to say that, again, being in the position that we're in, especially I've been removed from the corporate workforce for six years now. And when I can look back and see all of my former friends and colleagues and coworkers who's actually moved on to bigger and better things and who's actually struggled, there's a very clear correlation. There are very clear set of things that those who've gone on to do bigger and better things have done that many of the other people have. And I think one of the biggest things is that those people never really hit the ground running in terms of activating their network. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's what's happening or here's what happened. Hey, maybe you saw the news. I was a part of this thing. Instead, they just kind of hunker down. Mm -hmm. They go home and then you end up asking others like, hey, did you ever hear about, you know, you, you go from seeing someone every single day and now it's like, I don't hear from them anymore mm -hmm. because they're not plugged in. Yeah. Right. No. And as a result, no one can look out for them. And so they yeah, may you're be, not top of mind. No, you're not top of mind. And so something comes up and to your point, like you're not thought of, you're not mentioned. And so a couple of things that I've seen work really, really well here is one, when you make that announcement on LinkedIn or on Facebook or maybe it's a private email or whatever it is, not centering it around this position of loss or need, right? Like really kind of poking your chest out and saying, hey, I am here. I am now available, looking at it more so like a free agent instead of someone who just got cut from a team. And mm -hmm. this is the kind of tone that I've seen work really, really well. Um, playing to your strengths, right? Saying, hey, I am one of the most creative videographers and whatever it is, I'm just making something up. I am one of the best. I've done this, this, and this in the last 12 months. I've been recognized here, here, and there. I would like to help your team X, Y, Z. Yeah. Right? I love solving these kinds of problems. Correct. I am aware of organizations that are lean. I love finding creative solutions on limited budgets. Yes. Whatever it is. Yeah. You And, and you want to be authentic in yes. whatever you're saying. You don't have to come out and say like, oh, I lost my job and I need your help. That's implied in the message, but you don't have to physically, literally say those things. Yeah. And, and I would say the reason for that is because the 
sob story just makes people say, oh, no, I'm so sorry. And then yes. they hit you with canned language as opposed to I have something I to offer. Yeah. I can help you. I'm really good at these things because that's ultimately what so much of business and, and employment is about. It's like We have a problem. Can you help me fix it? Right. The way that you position that stuff is really, really important. I'll say one of the other really subtle skills that I've seen people who've pivoted really well is engaging with other people's work, right? And this is where LinkedIn as a platform really starts to shine is that instead of every single day kind of doing some of the things that we've said and highlighting to your strengths and saying, hey, I'm looking to connect with X, Y, Z, it's engaging with the other people who might be able to help you. It's like they're there talking about whatever it is. If you have something to offer, start showcasing your actual strengths or revealing some of these other things that you can actually do by engaging with other experts, other people who have followings. And it's one of the best ways to show yourself to people that you likewise would not have been able to uh, be showcased to before. And so those are just a couple of things that I think um, really, really help. So don't keep that stuff to yourself and make sure that you're getting out there and be smart and kind of smooth with the way that you do it. Cause I think that's one of the best ways to connect with people. The last thing I will say, and I think this is important for people who are really struggling to deal with that sense of, um, kinship that they may have had with a former coworker or someone that they used to work with that's really, really close to them. You're now connecting with them and engaging with them on LinkedIn or in some other social platform. And what I find is that people expect the same level of closeness to be conveyed there. And it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not the same thing, right? So yes, we were best friends or we could buddy, buddy and laugh in the elevator or in the break room, but now we're on LinkedIn. It's a different playing field. A lot of those jokes aren't going to fly or I'm now trying to even position myself because I'm also out here or also trying to build my network. A lot of this boils down to soft skills and networking skills, but like you really should not expect that unless you are absolutely sure that you have that kind of relationship with people. You may find that people are slower to respond. Uh, They may not be as willing to kind of laugh or be humorous with you. Like it's, it's, it's a different tone based on the times that we're in, but it's also just a different environment. So I think just a couple of these kind of casual skills that I think it's almost like dating skills. (laughs) It's like, hey, man, don't just go out there and tell people like, I'm single (laughs) or she broke up with me. You know, it's like, nah, man, just play cool. (laughs) Just post a new pic, you know, say, oh, you know, go into such and such tomorrow. Anyone know what I might be able to find when I get there? It's like, okay, where you going? Yeah, Yeah, I, I definitely empathize with people who, keep it a secret because it's a blow to the ego. And it may not even be like an embarrassing thing. Sometimes people are just more private. They don't post on social often. And when they do, the last thing they want it to be is a layoff announcement. And so for those people, I would suggest maybe don't post about your layoff announcement directly, but you can certainly start posting on a regular basis about what you're doing, what you've accomplished. Or you can say, you know, first day looking at jobs and I'm overwhelmed by how much things have changed and what you're doing doing is sending out a signal to people who are either in a similar situation as you or someone who may be in a position to help you. And it just kind of starts to build a community of people that may help you. And if you feel like maybe you're worried about being a burden to your network, or maybe you've already made an ask and you're worried about exhausting your resources, just remember that posting on social media is not like sending a text message to the group chat. The likelihood that your followers even see whatever you post is limited. It's going out into the abyss of the internet. And so you want to be more intentional about what you're sharing and what you need. And then once you post that, you want to make sure that you dig deeper to find the gray areas of people who can help you. If eight people like your content or comment on your content, everybody in those eight people's network sees it. And so what you want to do is some follow-up work and see like, all right, well, who does this, who's person number one know? Who does person number two know? Can they offer me a warm intro? Who might've seen my content? Who engaged with it? And that way you can start to build up some momentum that doesn't make it feel like you're such a burden or that you're draining or using your network for something that 
you didn't plan to. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, so the second one, second mistake that we've seen people do is basically kind of keeping that information to themselves, not putting themselves in a position where they would easily get noticed by someone who might actually be able to help them get employed. So there's a lot of focus on kind of soft skills and ways to maneuver these new platforms and to kind of reach people or find people or at least help yourself get found. Um, Nice transition. I think to the third mistake that we've seen is it's almost like an, so much emphasis and focus on the soft skills. And it's like, great, you're creative. And yes, you, you know, you spend a lot of time, you know, engaging and, you know, a lot of people, but like we have very specific problems here that we're trying to solve. Like talk to me a little bit more about those things, like those hard skills. And so you really want to make sure that you are um, zeroing in on what those hard skills are. I think, too, you want to make sure that you are mindful of how in demand those particular skills may be now versus how the in, last time, the last time that you were able to actually land a job, even if it's just been a year. And I would say that I think is especially true now, because when I think back on the roles that I had and the things that uh, landed me a really good job back in 2012 or 2016, it's not even called that anymore. You know what I mean? So many different things have changed. In episode 53 of our podcast, we talked a lot about upskilling. And it was this idea of taking basically like your current skill set and adding on some other layers, some things that were in demand. We talked about the LinkedIn tool, which is called the Future of Skills tool. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, but this is a tool that really helps you say, hey, Back in 2022, back in 2021, these skills were in demand. And who better to know than LinkedIn, right? right? They're seeing all of these posts. They're seeing who's getting hired. They're seeing all the announcement. And now they're saying, hey, now this is what's in demand. So that one helps you identify these are the particular areas that I should be focused on if I want to increase my likelihood of getting a job, especially a high paying job. But also this is how I just need to reposition or yes. reframe who I am as a candidate and the value that I offer. That's what I loved about the future skills tool is that it not only tells you what skills are in demand, it also shows you how certain skills have evolved yes. for certain areas and changed over time. Yeah. So you can see sub skills and related skills and whether there's more demand or less demand. And so you can kind of see if you use those skills in 2009 to get the job and you might have positioned it around word processing. Well, now it's called something different. And now they expect you to also be able to publish that on the internet. Yeah. It's not just a matter of being able to write it. You need to understand back end tools. And that way you can kind of build yourself a curriculum and start to develop these hard skills the same way you would a network. So speaking about curriculum, the number of people who have added certifications to their LinkedIn profile just in the last two years increased 44%, right? Wow. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the disruption that we've seen because of the pandemic and all of these layoffs. And so what we're asking people to do is to like be a part of that 44%. Like you yeah. don't want to be the 56. You want to be a part of that 44. And I think this is particularly true when it comes to corporate employees. The way that they view self-development or personal development is, I'm just going to say, very limited relative to how entrepreneurs view their development, yeah. right? And again, I'm saying this from a position of privilege and advantage, having left those environments. You become not only just accustomed to a biweekly paycheck, but you become accustomed to... An annual review process. A, a, pay, a pace <laughs> of development that yeah. is set by someone else that likely has their interests in mind yeah. as opposed to a pace of development that has your own interests in mind and is based on what's available in the marketplace. Yeah. That's a completely different set. And so I remember being in those positions where it's like, this is the year that I'm going to learn how to do X, Y, Z, this fancy spreadsheet skill. And if I think about that in this now experience as an entrepreneur and was like, that's like a week's worth of development. Mm -hmm. If that, maybe mm -hmm. three days if we're being honest, right? But in that time, in that environment, you kind of pat yourself on the back. And so I think that's something that a lot of people are oftentimes confused about. They say, all right, well, I'm going to take this one thing. My recommendation is, no, you need to be taking like three things, mm -hmm. like whatever number of certifications you have, you need to be like tripling it mm -hmm. because that's what's actually going to help you, one, be more confident and two, open up a wider set of opportunities for you 
and help you stand out relative to people who are only kind of bringing one thing to the table. Yeah. I feel like we've been beating the drum on how critical LinkedIn is going to be for navigating the labor market for the majority of people, not everybody, but for the majority of people, especially those who have been neglecting their network or just haven't had the chance to build one yet. There are a little over 4 billion social media users in the world, and 1 billion of them are on LinkedIn. I mean, when I tell you it is a powerhouse for matching buyers and sellers or skills and employers, it it is like Google. It's like not using Google like (laughs) to not use LinkedIn to actually post what you're good at and hope for a match. Now, to your point, we've been self-employed for a while. And when you take that path, there's not this training and development department that is thinking about your knowledge gaps or proactively sourcing classes and certifications for you to take. But LinkedIn Learning does do that. They know exactly based off of their database of jobs and and managers and recruiters what you could learn. But if you don't use LinkedIn Learning, let's say you don't want to pay for the premium membership or you're not in a position to pay for it, you can create your own curriculum. So my general approach is to start with your current job title or whatever you know, and then pull up job descriptions and look at the language that they use to describe what you do every single day. And then you want to update the way that you talk about yourself and to yourself. You don't just want to mirror it because then you'll sound like, oh, you just memorize some fancy corporate words. Right. You actually want to become fluent in it. And the way to do that is to use search or hashtags to figure out how these skills actually come to life. YouTube is great for this. There are all kind of vlogs. There yeah. are all kind of case studies. There are all kind of tutorials, all kinds of stuff that you can use. And then you want to make sure that you're picking the thing that's going to be most advantageous to you. I'll give you an example. In our world, the difference between calling myself an influencer or a content creator or a blogger or a writer or even an author all net totally different results. Even when I think about my skills, if I just say content creation or video editing versus brand activation and strategic messaging, totally different words, totally different results. So you have to adjust your language and then go back and make sure that there aren't any knowledge gaps from that vantage point. And then after you've remixed your current skills, you want to move to the adjacent skills. And those are the skills that are close to the skills that you already have. And they just allow you to build on what you already know so that you're not starting from scratch. So if you are an email marketer, the next adjacent skill might be community manager yeah. or copywriter, something like that. That way you're just not starting from zero and you can just continue to stack your skills and your certifications and make yourself, you know, a more, it's like peacock feathers, make yourself a more attractive candidate. I agree. I could talk about LinkedIn all day. It's such a massive to your point. We've done one podcast on it. We've we may need to do, we've done two, excuse me. It's been in, mentioned in several. Yeah. I will add another one. Just a final uh, tidbit on this because LinkedIn is one of those platforms. And I hear this all the time where people say, yeah, I have a LinkedIn account, but I haven't been on it. Right. They yeah, say no. it. Like I think I hear that about that platform more than anyone else. And again, going back to the first uh, thing that we see a lot of people do is kind of assuming that this isn't going to happen. They're blindsided. So let's say it's been a year since you've been on LinkedIn. What you may not know is like the platform is completely different. And I'm not just talking about a redesign, but even the way that your profile is designed, what you might need to activate or verify or update so that you are making yourself visible to people who might be willing to help you is completely different. Like I've seen a lot of change in that platform, like just in the last six months, oh, like yeah. in a year. It's, I mean, it's almost like, like it might look like a MySpace account at this point. <laughs> like you have to stay on top of it. It is work, but trust me, this is how people are finding candidates these yes. days, especially for quality roles. And I think the other thing that I hear about LinkedIn is that it's so cringy. They don't like all the self-promotion or they feel turned off by the homepage of feed of user generated yeah. content. And to that, I say it doesn't matter. The site is still the site. Ask any recruiter, you know, whether they use LinkedIn and they're going to tell you, yes, yeah. the user interface has nothing to do with the function of matching employers with workers who have skills. And so the same way you don't ignore logging into your bank account because your bank's website is outdated or the same way that you don't ignore going into other sites that don't have the most pleasant user interface, don't let that be the thing that stops you from using the function of the site. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 
Enough about LinkedIn. Um, let's talk about the fourth mistake. And we really could have we could have started here. Yeah, to yeah. your point. This is one that we also see a lot, and I understand why. People have got a lot going on. They're still dealing with the shock and the shame and the embarrassment of it and all. And it feels hard. There's a huge, you know, you're not worried about the money that you feel is sitting in a nest egg because there's a sense of safety associated with that. But one of the biggest mistakes that we see people do um, in terms of dealing with layoffs is leaving their 401k with that employer, yes. right? There's this idea that it's it's safe there. I it's can't not touch it till I'm 50, whatever, w- w- anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's fine. And because you can, I think that's part of the problem. It's like they leave it there because they can. And yeah. they say, well, I'm going to do it in next month. And then they don't because they're more focused on trying to find the job. And time goes on and on and on before you know it. It's just sitting there, especially when you get a new job and you get a new 401k, hopefully. I think in some ways it just kind of sends this signal that it's okay. And it's not until something forces the issue where people actually say, oh, let me do something about it. And so what can you do about it? Well, there are really just a couple of options. One, you can keep it there. Do not recommend that at all. I can't stress that enough. Do not leave your 401k with your old employer if you've been laid off. You want to do one or the two other things that we're getting ready to say. One is conduct a withdrawal, which is going to come with some fees, right? So we're not necessarily recommending that, but you can do that. You are allowed to make a withdrawal so that you have cash and funds and the ability to tread water until you can replace uh, the income from your job. Uh, But what you should do, what you hopefully do, is roll over that 401k account, that retirement account, into a different kind of retirement account. And you want to do that for a couple of reasons. One, you minimize and avoid fees. Uh, Two, it's just going to further contribute to your retirement. Um, It helps make sure that you're not starting from zero with any new retirement accounts that you have. You're just kind of piling on to the money that you've been saving and investing over time. Um, But also because the IRS favors that. They don't tax you for making those rollovers. They don't treat those contributions the same way they might just a regular contribution. So it doesn't work against you. You don't have to deal with any of the minimums or any of those things. Now, there may be some minor account setup fees that you're going to have to deal with. But in most cases, those are going to be reasonable, especially if you're going with a reasonable brokerage or investment company. So you want to make sure that you're conducting a rollover if you can. Obviously, some people find themselves in a situation where they kind of take off a little bit, you know, and then they roll over the rest. Totally understand that. But the bigger issue here is making sure that you do not leave that money with your old employer. You absolutely don't want to do so, so what's at risk if you decide to leave your 401k with an old employer? A couple of things. One, you just might forget about it, which I don't even want to know. what. Ha- Actually, I do want to know what happens to money that people kind of forget um, about. Um, two, you lose track or forget like what you're invested in. So if you're making future investment decisions, you kind of don't have it top of mind anymore. You lose track of it. Even worse, you lose access to the account for any number of reasons. It could be... You know, that there's like a change in the platform or the intranet for that employer. You're accustomed to this thing, but they don't have that thing anymore. And now yeah, you your need old to HR contact, contact is gone. someone. Maybe that you, you always thought, because this happens a lot, right? Like whenever you're thinking about something with a company, like, oh, that's what Lynn does. Yeah. It's like, well, Lynn doesn't work here anymore. Yeah. Now you've lost the contact, which means you've Even lost Even something access. as simple as like your verification email, because yeah. you're signing in from a different device, goes to your work email, which you no longer have access Correct. to. There's a number of reasons why you lose track of what you're invested in because you can't see it. One of the things that I think people should really be mindful of is when the plan administrator might actually change. So I'll I'll, I'll give you an example here. Let's say the company um, partners with Wells Fargo to offer 401ks for their employees. That's who you have your retirement plan with. You get laid off. And then... After you're laid off, they actually decide to move from Wells Fargo to now have Vanguard or Fidelity now be the plan administrator. There's a whole host of documents and forms and boxes that you would need to check that if you were still employed there, you would actually get that information. Now, technically, you should be mailed that information. But again, once there's a disconnect in communications, that can lead to either delay which can lead to like you paying fees or even worse, maybe that money is no longer allocated the way that it was when you were working with, what did I say, Wells Fargo? Yeah. So now it's not set this way with Wells Fargo in, you know, these funds. 
for people who did not respond by this particular date, now it's going to sit in whatever fund we want it to be. Yeah, and that happened to me. And it's some target date fund. It is. And it's a little bit more expensive and maybe it's not really ideal and doesn't really work for your broader wealth plan and so on. There is a price to pay, literally, for leaving your money with a former employer, especially if they change administrators. That's exactly what happened to me. The company changed the plan administrator. They did mail a bunch of documents, but they came with all of the other documents that yeah, you get in the mail in when you are you know, transitioning from a company and our address changed. And so even that process of trying to get a new address on file at my old company yep. was a hassle. Luckily, I knew people that worked there, but they absolutely swept my investments into the plan's default, which yeah. was some random target date fund versus what I had been investing in, which was a total stock market index fund. Yeah. And so, yeah, you might think that because you put the money somewhere that that's where it stays. But if that plan administrator changes, you don't know that unless yeah. you can actually check on your money. Now, the other thing that could happen, and I would say this is even more traumatic, it could be if something were to happen to you and your beneficiaries didn't transfer over, or if you started making changes or had a different point of view on who you wanted your beneficiaries to be in, let's say, a will or a trust, but you didn't actually make those updates in your plan, um, in your in your particular plan to switch your old employer. And if something changed, like your marriage status, right? Imagine a world where you were employed with this company, you left your 401k there, you were married to Joe. And now you're not married to Joe anymore. Something happens. Joe is going to get that money. Yes. Right. Joe is going to get that money, regardless of what's in your will and your trust, because you did not make the updates yeah. in the 401k. Yes. Right? Beneficiary designations supersede wills and trusts yep. in most cases. And so it is super important that you are updating your beneficiaries every year yeah. and making sure that to Julian's point, that old 401k that you got from 1989 doesn't have your ex on it, or maybe you're a deceased family member, or, you know, you want to make sure that everything is aligned and says the correct stuff. Long story short, you really just want to make sure that you are taking care of your money, that you are taking yeah. that extra step, that you aren't ignoring that rollover process yes. or diminishing its importance relative to just finding another job. Like it's important. I know it's not fun. It's, it's, it's kind of like taxes. Yeah. Like it's an ugly kind of boring and like paperwork intensive experience, especially if we're dealing with a situation where you're being mailed a paper check for those funds. Like it can be a little messy, but I'd rather deal with a little bit of mess under my timeline while I have the time and the capabilities to dot the I's and cross the T's versus jumping into something else and then putting myself at risk for, for actually forgetting about it. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the paper check because when you choose to roll over your account, you have two options for how that rollover happens. There's the direct rollover, which means that you give your old administrator the information of where you want this check to go, and then they transfer it directly. Sometimes they might mail you a check with the new bank's information on it, but yeah. either way, it's a direct transfer. And then there's an indirect transfer, which is when they send you a check and then you deposit it, well, which is a wild I've experience. I've been through that experience. It is incredibly stressful. There's no like certified tracking number. Nope. It's just a check with you, however much money you have. You've never checked for the mailman more. Man, listen, and they can't tell you anything. Nope. Once they've once they've cut the check, they're not tracking it. Don't take like, a vacation. <laughs> they don't. They <laughs> don't. They don't tell you anything about where this money is. And there are tons of horror stories about people whose check has been lost in the mail and their accounts in limbo. And that matters because in either scenario, whether it's direct or indirect, you only have sixty days to deposit that check in the new account. Yeah. If you don't don't deposit, it's considered a distribution and you're going to have to pay some taxes and some fees because the IRS is basically like after two months, you're using this money or you plan to use this money. Yeah. And so I can't give you the same protections. The yeah. As a 401k. So after you get your check and you deposit it, this is the most important step. Once you deposited the funds into your rollover account, you have to invest them. Yes. Whether it is direct or indirect, it is 
highly unlikely and a 0% chance that Fidelity is going to take your funds from that index fund and directly invest them in Vanguard's version of the same fund. They're going to put a holding account, that cash account within the bank, and then you have to pick what funds or stocks you want to buy. Yeah, it don't will just stay deposit there as unsettled. Yeah, funds. don't just deposit it and think you're done because you see a balance in the account. You got to you got to buy some shares. Yeah. So don't forget that it's multiple steps and it is something that you definitely need to like clear a couple of hours for and be ready to get on the phone or whatever it is. But it's so important. That is your money and no one's going to care about it the way that you do. Yeah. I wish I did not know or have nearly as many examples as I do of people who heartbreakingly made that mistake. And, yeah. I, and I think we talk about that in, in several contexts, not just with respect to layoffs, but yes, a lot of people, especially those who are inexperienced, they've never been through this before, right? Which kind of makes sense. They just It's done automatically. Correct. You have to make sure that you make that investment decision. You can't just make the transfer. If you're doing it yourself, you need to go in there and then actually make the investment, make or place the order. And it is an ugly user interface in most cases. Yes. <laughs> so don't don't do what you did to link it, LinkedIn and not do it because it's confusing. Watch some YouTube videos. You can always shoot us an email and we'll, you know, show you what you're looking for. But like, yeah. don't just don't give up on it. Okay, so we talked about four big mistakes that we've seen people make uh, with respect to layoffs. Obviously, the last big one is making sure that you don't leave your retirement account with your old employer. Um, I did not plan on saying this fifth one, but I'm going to mention it because I just can't help myself. Um, and then we'll close. Do not make the assumption that just because you are no longer employed, that because you don't have a paycheck, that you can't invest. Right. Like that is not true. Self-employed people, uh, entrepreneurs, side hustlers, anyone really, you all can invest. Now, you might yeah. not be able to invest in an in employer sponsored plan because you don't have an employer. You can still open a retirement account. You can still open a taxable brokerage account. You can still open a robo advisor brokerage account. Any number of accounts might still allow you to take advantage of an opportunity. I'm not saying we need to be timing the market, but like if you're flush with cash, if you know that there's an opportunity for a job replacing that income, don't tell yourself or convince yourself, man, I really wish I could get a piece of that action because you can't. Yeah. It will require you to open an account, which you can do in probably five minutes. Yeah. We talk about that in our class, Making Money Grow, all of these other accounts, but it's my biggest beef with 401ks because so many of us, very similar to health insurance, tie the act of investing to employment. Yes. If I'm not employed, I don't invest. And as a result, you miss out on opportunities Absolutely. and you, you aren't able to actually take it full advantage of periods of no employment or low employment. And you can still invest. There's literally nothing stopping you other than like fear and not really knowing how. So hopefully yeah. we can help people get over that. Yeah, I think this is especially important for people who are fortunate enough to get a severance and maybe get a new job before that severance runs out. Yeah. And so now you've got this big amount that you have and a lot of people just end up leaving it in their savings account and using it as a cash cushion instead of opening something that is more liquid and accessible than a traditional retirement account like a taxable brokerage or like a robo advisor brokerage. So that you can put that money to work and access it for whatever you need and still realize the gains of the stock market. So yeah. I think that's a really important point yeah. that if you are unemployed or fun employed, look into other specialized investment accounts to supercharge whatever goals that you have. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, um, this was fun. <laughs> I know it's not a happy subject, but uh, I'm glad we got into it and we're able to offer some insight to yes. wrap, us, wrap us up. And hopefully you didn't take our tone the wrong way. We're talking to y'all the same way we would talk to a friend who's in the same boat or situation and hopefully you found it helpful. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular Podcast. If you like what you heard, you can let us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast platform or you can leave a comment below and keep the conversation going. We will see y'all next week with hopefully a happier subject. Yeah. <laughs> If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications. 